Well, if this microphone is working, and it is, may I welcome you all to St. Paul's Cathedral this evening. Uh, my name is Claire Foster Gilbert. I'm a former lay canon of St. Paul's and co-founder of St. Paul's Institute. Um, I, I want just to apologize for those of you who came a fortnight ago to hear uh, our speaker, David Bentley Hart, as you um, perhaps realized, I hope realized then, that he simply couldn't get out of the States uh, because of Hurricane Sandy. But we do apologize to you for that. I'm hearing plans for perhaps having him over here next year, so our chance will come again. Could you also raise your hand if you can't hear or if we're not speaking clearly enough? We do, ah, there's a hand waving here. I don't know if, is it not loud enough? Uh, the microphone is here. <laughs> the, the microphone is attached to my cheek. <laughs> How's that? Right. So I'll introduce our speaker in a moment. But for those of you who've not been to one of our events, events before, let me explain briefly what will be happening. In a moment, Timothy Radcliffe will talk to us about what is the point of being a Christian. If you have a question for him, please write it on the back of your leaflet while he's speaking and hold it up, right up, to be collected. We'll collect questions until about 7.30, do please keep them as brief as you can. We will end promptly at 8 o'clock, and Timothy's books will be for sale here under the dome after that, and he'll sign copies then too. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Timothy Radcliffe is a Dominican friar and one of the best-loved spiritual teachers of our times. He was master of the Worldwide Dominican Order from 1992 until 2001, the only member of the English province to have held the office since the Order's foundation in 1216, and has since returned to being a simple member of the Dominican community in Oxford. I had the privilege of being taught at Blackfriars when I was an undergraduate by Simon Tugwell, so I know your home a little. Timothy has taught theology at Oxford University, been involved in ministry to people with AIDS, travelled and taught widely in Asia, Africa and Latin America, and published numerous best-selling books about Christianity and the spiritual life. Timothy's going to talk to us tonight about what is the point of being a Christian, which began with that sharp question being put to him by a friend and ended with him winning the Michael Ramsey Prize for Outstanding Theology for the book he wrote in answer. The demand for him to speak, preach, lecture and lead retreats all over the world means that he more or less lives the life of a wandering friar, and we are delighted and honoured that he's here to speak to us tonight. Please welcome our speaker. They always say that if they applaud you at the beginning, uh, then it's an act of faith. If they applaud you halfway through, it's an act of hope. And if they applaud you at the end, it's an act of charity. Uh, thank you so much, Claire, for your, your kind words. You're one of our more distinguished ex-alumni. When Elizabeth Foy asked me to come this evening to talk to you about my book, What's the Point of Being a Christian?, I felt really pleased. It's rather like a parent being asked to talk about his or her child. Who can resist? But the trouble is, what parent knows when to stop? Endless photos of young Johnny playing with his toys. I'll try not to speak for too long. 
so that we got lots of time for discussion. And all I can really try is to give you a little bit of a savour of the book. Why I wrote it and what came next. The title of this series is Making the Case for God. And the idea, I assume, is that for many people, belief has become questionable, implausible. According to Charles Taylor, wonderful Canadian historian of ideas, who read an amazing book called uh, A Secular Age. According to Taylor, one of the signs of secularism is not necessarily that people stop believing in God, but that it becomes a sort of option. God's existence is no longer evident, as it's been to nearly all human beings throughout history. So almost uniquely, I think, in the modern West, we have to argue the case for God. And that was the context within which I wrote this little book. Now, as Claire said, one day I was having a dinner with a friend of mine in a Turkish restaurant, which I didn't actually particularly recommend, <laughs> uh, with a friend of mine who's a sociologist of religion. He taught at King's here in London, Peter. And Peter kept putting to me the question which his own son returned to time and again. Dad, he said, what's the point of being a Christian? What do you get out of it? And Peter insisted to me that we're never really going to interest, interest people in Christianity unless they see that it yields something, that it's useful. So Buddhism, he said, can give you a tranquility, a deep calm, um, new age spirituality might mean that you're in contact with the cosmos. Some forms of evangelical Christianity promise you great prosperity. Give to God and you will become wealthy. So, Peter asked me, what's the point of being a Christian? What do you get out of it? Now, I have to confess that initially I was rather resistant to the question. There's something rather grubby about being a Christian because it's going to give you something. It's rather like turning it into a, a lifestyle option, a useful accessory like aromatherapy or an entertainment like Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> now, I'm not a Christian because of what I get out of it, but because I believe it to be true. The point of religion is God. And I don't worship God because it's useful, but because God is God. God isn't part of my life support system, like having a good dentist or a fitness trainer. Trying to make God relevant to my needs sounds almost blasphemous. Everything's, the, the relevancy of everything has to be judged in relationship to God. But then I thought a bit further. If the truth of Christianity is at all significant, it must make a difference in your life. There must be something about the life of Christians which is provocative, inexplicable, which makes people pause and wonder. It certainly isn't that we are any better than anybody else. That would be an odious claim and is evidently untrue. And anyway, Jesus said, I came to call sinners not the righteous, and he goes on doing that. So what difference does it make? And what I argue in this book is that Christianity should touch us 
with a sort of strange freedom, a paradoxical joy, and an odd sort of courage. Now let's, and various other things, but I won't go into those this evening. Let's begin with freedom. In February 2000, I was visiting uh, the Order in the Czech Republic. And we had one evening in a little town in the south of the country called something like Šnomoj. And we had the usual sort of feast, you know, when Dominicans gather together, lots of beautiful beer and Šlibovic and fantastic Czech sausages. <coughs> and then, sorry, I'm not 100% well. And then it was the time for the discussion. And there was a young woman with a number of, of young children. And she said to me, Timothy, how can I convince my kids of Christian moral teaching? <coughs> she obviously had the same problem, many parents in the West. Now, to be honest, I didn't know how to answer that question. So I niftily passed the question, like a rugby ball, down the line to my assistant for Central Europe, a chap called Wojciech Giertig. Wojciech is a Pole, professor of theology at one of our universities in Rome, and he's now the Pope's personal theologian. So this isn't any old wishy-washy liberal like me. <laughs> he is, in a way, the top theologian in the church. He is the one who makes sure that the Pope doesn't say anything wrong. <laughs> Quite successfully, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's, it's nice to see your assistants doing well, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, Wojciech went over to a big blackboard and he drew a little square in the corner and he said, now inside that square, imagine you've got all the commandments. Is that what morality is about? And everybody said, yes. And Wojciech said, no. And then he drew a great big square, five times as big, and he said, all the rest, all that space is freedom. He said, God isn't actually very interested in commandments. All of moral theology is about teaching you to be free. That's the teaching of the Gospels. And even more important, of course, is the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> now, this answer fascinated me because it's in direct contradiction to the normal understanding of Christian morality that you get anywhere which is that it's about obeying rules especially the Ten Commandments I, I'm reminded of another Polish Dominican who on the night before the battle of Monte Cassino looked out of his tent and he saw thousands of Polish soldiers who wanted to come for confession. What could he do? So he made them all lie on the ground with their heads down. And he read out the Ten Commandments and he said, if you've broken one of the commandments, wag your left foot <laughs> and with your right indicate how many times. But here was another Polish Dominican with, a, with a, a much more fresh and liberating understanding of morality, the liberation of the human person. So I decided that when I had a sabbatical, I would go to Berkeley in California and study the moral theology of Aquinas. And what you find is, that it is in fact, all about forming us to be free and to share God's joy. It's really only in the 17th century, about the time that they're building St. Paul's Cathedral, that you see the rise of the idea that morality is about 
submission of the will to the law. Freedom. Freedom for us certainly includes freedom of choice. The freedom to choose to do what is right or not. But what the gospel shows us is a deeper freedom which is to give your life away with the spontaneity of Jesus. Freedom is a deep liberation of the heart and the mind without which freedom of choice makes no sense at all. So it's a paradoxical sort of freedom. It's a freedom which appears to surrender itself. It's the freedom which you see supremely in Jesus when he says, this is my body and I give it to you. One of my closest friends in the order is uh, a French Dominican, a Breton, actually he wouldn't like being called French, called Jean-Jacques Perenez. We studied together in, in Paris, much of the time in the Académie de la Bière, where they had over 120 different sorts of beer. <laughs> Jean-Jacques trained as an economist, and his first mission in the order was to go to Algeria, where he, he looked at problems of irrigation in the Sahara. He was deeply happy, embedded in the country, making friends with Muslims, feeling that he was of service. And then one day, his provincial rang him up and said, I want you to come home and be the student master. And Jean-Jacques was initially completely thrown. He was having to surrender something so deeply important. But then he remembered that his supreme act of freedom was to give his life for the mission, for the preaching of the gospel, to the order. So he went and found a bottle of champagne, which was a bit of a challenge actually in Algeria, and he gathered his friends and he said, let us drink to freedom, the freedom to give our lives away. And then a few months later, I was elected master of the order and I was looking for a senior assistant who I knew well, who I could work with. And I tracked down Jean-Jacques, who was on retreat. And I said, Jean-Jacques, will you come to Rome and work with me? And he said, can I think about it? I said, of course. He said, can I take a month? I said, well, what about a day? And he said, oh, don't bother, I'll come. But he said, you've got to get another bottle of champagne. Now that, it seems to me, is the spark of Christian freedom. It's a freedom that you exercise in a variety of ways, perhaps giving your lives to your, your wife, your husband, your partner, giving your life to research, giving your life without reserve for the search for justice and peace, or even becoming a Dominican. And then there's joy. Who on earth is going to see that there's any point in being a Christian if we are miserable? H.L. Mencken, the American newspaper editor, defined Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. Dorothy Day, the founder of uh, the Catholic worker movement, she said, it's joy that brought me to faith, joy at the birth of my child 35 years ago. You will know your vocation by the joy it gives you. Charles de Foucault was a, an ascetic monk who lived in the Sahara and eventually died there, murdered. And he came back to Paris and he met his nephew, who was a, a rich young man who thought of himself as a great hedonist, 
who enjoyed the good things of life. But his nephew describes how the moment that he saw his uncle, he realized that he didn't know what happiness was. He said, he entered the room and peace entered with him. The glow of his eyes and especially the very humble smile that had taken over his whole person. There was an incredible joy emanating from him. Having tasted the pleasures of life and able to entertain the hope of not having to leave the table for a while, I suddenly realized that I hardly knew what happiness was. It's certainly not having a bad cold, I can tell you. We believe that, that human beings are made for happiness. That is God's will. And his will will be accomplished. It's said that when St. Francis preached to the fish, even the fish were happy. Though naturally, as a Dominican, I would like to wonder how you can tell a sad fish from a happy one. Young people want, above all, to be happy. But the happiness that young people seek is fragile and threatened. It has to be fought in a world with as much violence, sexual abuse, drugs, inner city desolation, collapse of the family, and maybe a whole lifetime of unemployment. A recent book that I've only had time to glance at by Harriet Sargent is called Among the Hoodies, My Years with a Teenage Gang. And it shows you the utter desolation of so many people in our world. And this is a happiness which is all the harder to obtain because it's an obligation. You have to be happy. You know the way that uh, shopkeepers say increasingly when you buy anything, enjoy. It's not even an option. To my daily fury, the honeypots of Blackfriars have enjoy written on the lids. It infuriates and ruins my breakfast every day. <laughs> and when the aeroplane takes off, they sit back and say, sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. And if one does feel sad, then this is seen as failure. A survey conducted by the Church of England of the young, aged between 15 and 25, said sadness is not easily acknowledged in the face of achievable happiness. For this reason, sadness may be a powerful source of hidden shame and loneliness for young people. One reason for the epidemic of suicides in our society is people feel that when they're sad, they're failures. So we are called to embody the beginnings of the joy of the kingdom. But again, it's a paradoxical joy because it embraces the opposite, which is deep sorrow. The most joyful saints are always those who know how to sorrow. Like St. Dominic, I have to mention him of course, who, who liked to laugh with his brethren in the day and to weep at night with God. Or St. Francis of Assisi, who was the, the poverello, the joyful little poor man, who was also the man of the stigmata of the cross. The opposite of joy isn't sorrow. I don't think that you can begin to know what real joy is until you've been touched by the suffering of the world. A joy which is blind to what people live is simply hardness of heart. The seed of my vocation as a religious and a priest was the extraordinary joy of a Benedictine great uncle of mine He'd been a chaplain in the First World War 
Every night he'd gone out into no man's land to look for the dying and to bury the dead. He lost an eye, he lost most of his fingers, but he still carried on right to the end at the front. But when you met my great uncle, my uncle Dick, you were bowled over by his inexhaustible joy. I think if people can glimpse that, then they might see something of why we are Christians. Finally, at this stage, I just want to mention courage. Courage is not being unafraid. According to Sir Thomas Aquinas, it's being it's not being the prisoner of your fears. I suppose the greatest fruit for me of, of my nine years as master of the Dominican order was meeting men and women all over the, the planet who lived in situations of great distress with vast courage. Uh, I'll just mention one example, but I could give a whole talk on it. One of our brethren, Henri Burin de Rosier, is a lawyer, and he works in Brazil combating slavery. There are vast estates the size of Wales uh, where rich landowners basically capture poor people and keep them captive. I remember one case of a couple who tried to escape. They were hunted down by dogs, and then they were cooked, and then they were fed to the pigs. Henri takes these people to court, and now, finally, he's beginning to have some success. He was rather chuffed when one rich landowner put $30,000 on his head. But he rang me the other day to say how sad he was that he's been devalued. <laughs> he's only worth $20,000 now. When I stayed with Henri, I didn't realize that he put me in his room for the night. <laughs> he said he never slept a wink. Because if they'd come to kill him that night, they'd have got me instead. Which would have been a bit embarrassing. So, freedom, joy, courage... All these are find expression in our hope. And our hope often takes the form of song. Songs that keep the pilgrims walking. I came to preach here at St. Paul's not so long ago. Maybe some of you were here. I was asked to preach on the feet on St. Stephen and St. Paul. And I invoked the example of an extraordinary film, which I hope you've all seen, De Dieu des Hommes, of Gods and Men. The story of this little community of Trappist monks in the 90s, living up in the Atlas Mountains, deeply embedded in the Algerian people, who finally find themselves engulfed in violence. The violence of the army, the violence of the terrorists. And there's an extraordinary scene where they're gathered in the chapel, nine fragile, mainly elderly men, and this helicopter is hovering overhead with its terrible, violent beat. And all they can do is they sing. They sing, O Père des Lumières, O Father of Lights, Eternal Light and Source of All Light, you illuminate us at the threshold of night with the radiance of your face. The shadows are not shadows for you, for night is as clear as the day. Faced with, faced with that violence, they sing. That's the only expression of a hope which is beyond our articulation. Why is it that so often the hopeful people sing. You think of somebody like um, Albie Sachs, anti-apartheid campaigner, imprisoned in Cape Town in 1963 in solitary confinement. 
desperately finding, trying to keep his hope alive. And he starts to whistle Dvorak's Jack's New World Symphony, the Largo. And he hears somebody whistling back. That's music that gives hope. When my father was dying, I went to see him in hospital and he asked me if I could bring in his Walkman. And he wanted to listen in the face of death to Haydn's seven last words and to Mozart's Requiem. Faced with death, you want music. So it's not surprising that Lenin wasn't very keen on music. He said, I can't listen to music. It makes me want to say silly, sweet, sentimental things and pat people on the head. But you have to beat people's heads mercilessly. One of the ways that we make the case for God is through music, especially in places like St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, so that's very briefly the book. A few months after it had been published, I had another meal with Peter. And this time, thanks be to God, not in a Turkish restaurant. And he told me that his son had read the book. He didn't know that the book was written in answer to a query of his own son. And his son said, well, that's all very well. I enjoyed the book. It wasn't bad, really. I could see Christ is amazing. Uh, but, you know, institutional religion is so dull. Why should I go to church? What's the point of dragging yourself off to bite a bed on a Sunday? So drat it, I had to write another book. <laughs> Why go to church? And I can't help resist telling you the story at the beginning. You've, some of you may know it, obviously, about the mother who went in to wake up her son. She said, get up, get up, it's time to go to Mass. Ten minutes later, no sign of him. So she went back again. You've got to get up. And he said, oh, mother, why? It's so boring. And she said, you know perfectly well that you must go to Mass on a Sunday. And secondly, you are the bishop of the diocese. <laughs> so in this, this second book, I try to show how these extraordinary qualities, and the other ones I mentioned in the book, but this joy, this freedom, this courage, and so on, are embedded in the worship, our shared worship of God. And then I wrote another book called Take the Plunge, which I hope you're all going to buy. My friends tell me they think it's the best book, so please buy it. And there I try to look at the sacrament of baptism and try to see how this vitality, this exuberance of Christianity, this, this inextinguishable joy is granted to us in the sacrament of baptism. But since then, since I wrote that book, which is about uh, six months ago, I have begun to see things differently. I've moved on a little bit. And I think the question that I would put now, making the case for God, is that we have to find a way of touching people's imagination. A few months ago, there was a debate at Oxford between the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and Professor Richard Dawkins, the aggressive atheist. Though I have to be careful about saying that. Once I mentioned used that phrase in a lecture and I got a letter saying, how dare you call us aggressive, you miserable little <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And that's before she got aggressive. <laughs> it, it, it was a fascinating debate. I really felt that nothing 
that Richard Dawkins said any of us could really disagree with. He gave a brilliant, fascinating, scientific explanation of so many features of our world that we would simply have to accept. And you could see that Rowan Williams made, as he would, the good, courteous man that he is, made the effort to enter his scientific imagination and meet him there. But what was evident was that Dawkins could not make the opposite journey. At the end of the debate, Rowan talked with great eloquence about the, the infinite mystery of love, about gratitude, but you could see that Dawkins simply couldn't get it. He couldn't imaginatively enter Rowan's world. It's like somebody who has no musical sensitivity trying to understand the music of Bartok. I'm a great fan of a Korean Dominican painter called Kim En Yong, who paints these wonderful, great, extravagant canvases, abstract, with lots of, of vibrant color, reds and yellows all over them. And I remember taking my mother to see a vast one that I had in my office in Rome. And she looked at it and she said, oh, Timothy, she said, it looks a, a bit like your habit after an exceptionally dirty breakfast. <laughs> I mentioned this extraordinary film of gods and men. I went to see it in a cinema in Oxford up the Cowley Road, filled with members of faculty and students, many of them, I suspect, not committed Christians. But at the end, there was complete silence. You know when you get to the end of a film and, and nobody wants to go, you know, you stay on and see who is the best boy and who did the hair. And I went with a friend of mine who's uh, an atheist, well, an agnostic on a good day, and he was reduced to tears. And so I was left with the question, why did this film so touch us all? Well, that would be another lecture, and I've only got five minutes left, and I can see Claire will start to be fidgeting quickly in a moment. I would say fundamentally, it is because of the extraordinary dramatic story that it told. Martha Nussbaum, the uh, American Jewish philosopher, wrote an interesting article in the Times Literary Supplement uh, two or three weeks ago, in which she explains that really the people who, who have changed our perception of the world recently have always been novelists. Charles Dickens' Hard Time, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, she said, it was crucial to bring people to oppose slavery. John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. For most of the history of Christianity, our faith wasn't primarily the ascent to a number of dry propositions. It was finding yourself inside the dramatic story of God's love affair with humanity. Every time you entered a church, you went under the, through the porch, usually with the last judgment over it. You were brought inside the Christian history. Just a week ago, I was uh, giving a lecture in Assisi in the Basilica of St. Francis. And all the walls are covered by these amazing frescoes of Giotto. And they show us, if you want, the dramatic life of St. Francis, tearing his clothes off, throwing them in front of his father, preaching to the birds, receiving the stigmata. To go into the church was to enter a story which is ultimately the story of every one of us. And in the 
13th century, the Franciscans used the most modern media as the Dominicans did with Fra Angelico later on. Every medieval cathedral is a story in glass and stone. The story about how God became human so that we might become divine. And Charles Taylor argues that in the 16th, 17th century, particularly in Northern Europe, we lost this dramatic story of divinization, of transformation. Other stories captured our hearts. Stories of scientific progress, the great story of the Enlightenment, stories of imperialism and conquest. But without that great drama, Christianity is in danger of becoming either a vacuous spirituality, you know, light a few candles and dance around and a bit of Myers-Briggs psychology, or an empty, hard moralism. So I think one of the reasons you can argue that people started writing novels is because Christianity no longer provided a great drama for us to live. So I think we have to make the case for Christianity, make the case for God, by discovering again the great drama of our death and resurrection. In the Renaissance, they took crazy odd people, you know, like Michelangelo and Caravaggio, difficult people who had odd views, but they were unafraid to get the most creative people and ask them to tell the story. Just as the Dominicans in the early 20th century France, I think particularly of somebody, somebody called Couturier, who founded La Sacre, he got involved with people like Matisse, Le Corbusier, Braque, and he got them painting for the church, even if they didn't really believe. And I think we have to have that courage to be involved with the most creative people, the most creative musicians, or filmmakers, or bloggers, or web designers, or whatever it may be, and be unafraid if occasionally, you know, they do slightly crazy things. So unless we have that courage, we're not going to make the case for God today. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. So the deal is, um, I get to watch telly here and, and you ask questions. No, actually the questions are coming up on this screen. Um, uh, uh, and there are already a few here. Um, uh, we want some wild and risky questions. And uh, what we're going to do, sit down again, is we're just going to have a couple of minutes for you to sit quietly, reflect on what you've heard, let the wilder and riskier questions bubble up. You don't have to say who you are, um, and we'll continue to collect them and give uh, Timothy two minutes rest. It's strangely hard being silent in church. <laughs> so um, I wanted to pick up um, riskiness, actually, and I think um, you want to go to. I think that uh, definitely Christianity is altogether more risky than we mostly give it credit for. It's more interesting. It's more demanding. I think the rites of uh, baptism and confirmation are shocking rites of passage, and they've been domesticated. Um, w would you just say something about that, something about the riskiness of being a Christian? Uh, I'd say that on the one hand, uh, we have to put before people that what's ultimately at issue is whether you're prepared to, to live and die. Um, I'm always very moved when I go to Africa and I visit the cemeteries uh, around our priories and you see people going out in the 19th century 
usually die by the age of about 32, 33. It costs everything. Uh, and Christianity, of course, in the, in the first centuries, uh, one of the reasons I think that Christianity won the admiration of the Romans was because they saw we were prepared to die. We witnessed with our lives. But it, can but, I just interrupt? We aren't on the whole being asked to die for our faith, at least not in the West. Does it take that? The, well, how, can, how can we in this cathedral or in the streets of London be risky with our Christianity? <laughs> well, well, yeah, that's a good question. What I was going to say after, is, <laughs> is we have to counterbalance that sense of, of asking everything with, I think, a wide open acceptance of people who may be fairly mediocre. And I think this is a really, really difficult thing to do. I don't think we want a Christianity which is elitist. Uh, we don't want a Christianity where you, you, you have big barriers to shut out the people with, with lots of questions and doubt and so on. They have a place. So I think it's a very delicate thing about how you combine some sense uh, of the riskiness of Christianity with, if you want, the hospitable welcome that Jesus gives to people who just turn up and want somehow to belong in some undramatic way and um, maybe often um, unheroically. But then, of course, you ask the second part, Claire, which is, what about the riskiness here? Uh, I, I think there are different sorts of, of risk, really. Um, there are the risks that are involved, I think, politically, um, in uh, being critical of, of how our financial system works. Uh, we all depend on benefactors. Uh, we all uh, are wanting to befriend people uh, who will help us keep some Pauls up and black friars and so on. And I think uh, some courage is required to speak, if you want, honestly about the failings of our own society. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, there is a temptation to emasculate uh, our Christianity and make it as if it's all just about nice Jesus. I think also, because still at this moment, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of Christians who today live at the risk of their lives. A friend of mine, uh, Rupert Short, published a book, it was last week, called Christianophobia, in which he, he points out to the the hundreds of thousands of Christians who actually risk their lives today for their faith. And it could be quite important that our churches here are prepared to have a presence there, are prepared to, to, to visit them and be with them, even though it may very well be quite dangerous. Thank you. So we've got quite a few what's the point questions. <laughs> Uh, one of which is, what's the point of being a gay Christian at the moment? That's a good question. I, I think that the, the point of being a gay Christian is the same as uh, being any other sort of Christian, uh, which is that a, a gay person, like every one of us, is learning how to love. And that's the most important thing. Uh, Cardinal Basil Hume, I always found quite inspiring on this. He said, if somebody's gay, why do we always immediately want to think about what they're getting up to in bed? Uh, the most important thing about anybody who's gay or straight or uncertain or confused is that they have the capacity uh, to love another and that God is in that love. God is in the love of two gay people just as much as he's in any love. Um, and so, uh, and I think that that's why um, the church would collapse if we didn't have gay Christians. Uh, so often gay Christians 
uh, are among the most creative people, the greatest friends that we have. Um, but never the first question is whether they're gay or not. The first question is whether they love. And like every one of us, it's painfully learning how to love well. In that sense, I think the challenge is no different for gay people. I think we have to be completely unafraid uh, about um, implicating gay people in all our mission. Uh, and uh, often there's an assumption that if you're gay, somehow you're second class, somehow you're on the edge, you're not the real thing. Uh, and that, I think, uh, we have to do away with. I was very pleased to see that the Archbishop of Canterbury-elect made clear that Christianity must have absolutely nothing to do with homophobia. Um, thanks be to God. Thank you. Uh, and this question has come up from quite a few people, so I have to ask it, um, which is, what's the point of belonging to different kinds of church? I guess we all want you to be an Anglican, basically. But what's yeah. the point of belonging to different, kind, to different denominations? I, I long for us to find Christian unity together. Uh, I do believe that uh, the resurrection was the triumph of love over hatred and of unity over division. And so it seems to me that as a Christian, I must, I have a, an absolute moral imperative to seek the unification of all Christians. Because this is an intrinsic part of being a Christian, is that we be one. Let them be one as we are one. Jesus says in chapter 17 of St. John's Gospel, just to show that Catholics also read the Bible sometimes. <laughs> now, unfortunately, because of our failures, uh, there have been splits and divisions in the church pretty well from the beginning. And this is deeply tragic. Uh, I think the first thing that we have to, to recognize is the way in which we have caused these ourselves. I know that as a, as a Catholic, uh, and I deeply love my church, even though it drives me crazy often, uh, I have to face the failures of my church, which have contributed to Christian disunity. Um, uh, I think myself that we cannot have a real gathering together of us all into one body until we're all transformed I can see the transformation that's needed in my own church which is uh, considerable devolution decentralization we have to reinsert the bishop of Rome into the college of all the bishops I, I, can, I could tell you um, at, at a tedious length <laughs> what I think we have to do. Steady on, steady on. Because there's <laughs> another question here which says, what should the Church of England learn from the Dominicans? <laughs> ah. <laughs> I remember when I went to the Lambeth Conference, I had the tremendous pleasure of being uh, at the Lambeth Conference from beginning to end, which I think will get me into heaven. And about four or five times a day, an Anglican bishop would say to me, it must be rather good for you Catholics to see democracy in action. You don't know much about it. <laughs> uh, and I did usually restrain myself from saying, democracy? You haven't begun to get it. I, I think in the churches, I, I, I think you in the Anglican Church, have a very fine tradition of debate and voting. And I'd say that what, in the order, we make a profound link between debate and reasoning and try to understand those with whom you differ. Uh, one of our, um, our boasts 
is that we've never divided as an order. The other orders have divided and fragmented and split into little groups. We've always remained one. Uh, and part of it is that we actually believe that faced with dissent, faced with disagreement, if you take the time and you think, if you think and you listen and use your intelligence charitably, you can get through to the other person. Uh, and I think that is a lesson for, for, for Catholicism equally. We are listening. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a related point, um, but in a sense this is perhaps more to do with being in an order and being a Christian who's not uh, dedicated his life as you have to an order. So you, um, you spoke about um, uh, being told by your superior to move from one place to another and this one monk who was doing an extraordinary job in Algeria, was it, and then asked to come and do something else. Uh, have you, have you ever disobeyed or thought that the uh, order that you've been given is just so ridiculously unreasonable and not what's wanted and not what your heart is saying, that there hasn't been joy, in other words, in the obedience? And uh, what did you do? Um, I, I've not had that yet, but it could happen tomorrow. Uh, of course, uh, again with us, obedience is, is, is very deeply linked with listening, ob audience, to listen deeply. Obedience is mutual. Um, uh, sometimes it happens uh, that a brother, in the end, accepts to do something that they don't really want to do. I've ne uh, but, but there has to be a lot of time for discussion, a lot of time for listening, a lot of time for finding your way forward. But it is what binds us all together. Obedience, not blind obedience. We always say blind obedience is bad obedience. You know, if you think obedience is planting cabbages upside down, you're going to the wrong order. Um, the supreme authority in the order is always the chapter. It's not the superior. It's the general chapter, the provincial chapter, the house chapter. That's the supreme authority, your brothers. Yes, I'm reminded of that moment in the film of Gods and Men you've been quoting from, uh, where they discuss and they discuss again and they discuss again what they will do, whether they will stay or whether they will go. And one of the older monks simply says, I don't know yet. And there's something there about a long time. Uh, and that at that same moment, I think, Claire, uh, one of the brethren said to the prior, Christian de Clergé, he said, we didn't elect you to make decisions for us. Very good. So now we've got quite a lot of questions which are around this point, um, this question, how can the church be a successful promoter of freedom? Hmm. Gosh. Uh, I, I think that we, um, one of the things we have to do is, is obviously have a presence um, where the debates are happening, particularly about human rights. Uh, most of the big Catholic orders, like the Dominicans and Franciscans, we established uh, a permanent presence at the Human Rights Commission in Geneva. And we also have a permanent presence at the United Nations in New York so that any issue, major issue of human rights, uh, we can gather information and make presentations. Uh, I think we have to learn a great deal more interior freedom ourselves, uh, and we have to be unafraid of, of saying when we don't know, uh, unafraid of admitting that sometimes we're searching for an answer, um, and I think, if I may say so, uh, I think Rowan Williams, for whom I have an immense admiration, I think Rowan had an enormously, he was enormously courageous in taking us as far as he had understood and no further. He had a sort of freedom faced with his own ignorance sometimes, and that's a tremendously powerful sign of freedom. Uh, people criticize Ryan sometimes saying he's not been a great leader. 
I think in some ways he's exercised fantastic leadership by his honesty and by his, his trust in, in God. I think we should be much freer in letting ourselves be associated with people um, who, which might lead to misunderstanding. You know, so often the thing is we don't want to send the wrong message. <laughs> well, Jesus was always sending the wrong message. I mean, with this gay issue getting so sensitive, our bishops should have an open house and say, I'm going to have a gay party, you know? Invite people in. I might send the wrong message. <laughs> I don't think you can ever preach the gospel unless you're unafraid of sending the wrong message. Thank you. So something, I think this um, leads on in some ways um, about uh, imagination, um, spiritual imagination. I, I really heard what you said and others too uh, about this communicating with um, the, the kind of militant atheism we've seen in, 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 in Richard Dawkins and, and what it might feel like um, uh, uh, for him where there seems to be no imaginative leap into the sorts of joyous things that Christianity can express. Um, so, and how can that, how can there be communication? And, and just linked to that, a question about um, the drama of the story keeping the drama of the story without it sounding like fiction or untruth. Have I got to give you my microphone now? No, no, that's fine. Is it? I'm just getting a little rest. Oh, is it? <laughs> would you like a microphone? Uh, I think it would probably fall off, you know, Claire okay. usually does. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Good. Even at the back. I was saying, can you hear me at the back? <laughs> I, I just wonder if the sound chap can move the mic so you can sit down and continue on answering questions with the microphone. That would be possible. Yeah, that'd, why don't I get going now? Yeah, you get going on spiritual uh, imagination, drama, without sounding like fiction or untruth. Well, you see, one of the reasons that this, um, this story about the monks was so powerful is that it evidently isn't a fiction. Um, and um, uh, I went to Algeria just four weeks after they were murdered and uh, to visit one of my brethren who's the Bishop of Oran, Pierre Claverie, because he'd received death threats as well. Uh, and uh, so we spent some time going around the diocese and every morning he had to telephone to see where there was least likely to be an ambush. And, uh, and then four weeks later, he was himself assassinated. So these are real lives, uh, and they're, they're real martyrdoms. Uh, and we, we have to, there's nothing fictional about it at all. Uh, hmm. And the story of Christ, I guess, is also powerful because true. That it's... Powerful because it's true. Yes, of course, you, you have to see, and this is the tricky thing at the beginning, how the way that each of the four Gospels is imaginatively true in a different way. They're not true in the same way. Mark's wonderful, spare, compressed account, quite ascetical, isn't true in the way that John's Gospel is true. Uh, they, it's, it's like comparing opera and a, and a string quartet. Uh, and the difficulty is that we live in a very literalistic culture. Uh, science, less so now, I think, and I'm not a good scientist. I think there was a moment when science tended to, or at least our misunderstanding of science, push us towards a terrible literalism. So, um, which is where you get the birth of, of, of biblical fundamentalism at the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, we, we have to, to rediscover, uh, if you want, the biblical imaginations, which are so different from each other, and, and let other people tell the story 
in the way that people like Pasolini did, or even I think Jesus Christ Superstar, <laughs> rather well. Not, I thought, that uh, rather awful passion one, you know, by that American actor, I forget his name, The Passion. I didn't like that. Um, Mel Gibson, thank you. <laughs> uh, exactly, thank you. Uh, I, I think it, the, the implausibility of Christianity is in some way linked to the fact that artistic creativity is not an ordinary thing in our culture. I think that it should be an ordinary part of being a human being, is that you paint and you compose and and you sculpt and you dance or whatever. Act. Act. Human societies normally recognize that this is an ordinary thing. I remember when I went to the novitiate of the order in Guatemala, every one of the dozen novices had made something artistic for me. I mean, it wasn't great art, it wasn't Michelangelo, uh, but that didn't matter. And it's because we've delegated creativity so often to experts that we tend to, to read the world in plodding, ploddingly literalistic fashion. Hmm. Thank you. Sit down. Behold, my redeemer cometh. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thanks. Do you want to just speak into it? We, could s we can see. Is that working? Can you hear? Oh, yes. <laughs> Breath. And there was a small wind. So, uh, in many ways, Jesus was the ultimate subversive. Is there a place for subversives in the churches today? Absolutely. Uh, we got lots of them in the Dominican order. I, I think there are different forms of subversion, aren't there? Uh, there is the sort of cynical subversion uh, which simply undermines the negative word, the deflating word, the destructive word. And for that sort of subversion, I, I do not think that we have a place. Uh, I think there is a big place for people who will try to take us where we haven't gone before. Um, Meister Eckhart, uh, another Dominican, 14th century German Dominican, he said, you cannot find the truth without a hundred errors on the way. And so we have to give people the space to try things out, to turn things upside down, uh, and uh, find their way to some new truth that we hadn't suspected before. So we need that sort of creative subversion, which is often to be found uh, with the artists. Max Ernst in 1923 uh, produced a painting, a famous painting, of Our Lady Spanking Jesus. <laughs> and people were so shocked, it had to be removed from the exhibition and locked up <laughs> for its own protection. Um, but then you have to say to yourself, well, maybe the real scandal was that God became flesh and blood in a little baby who probably needed a good spanking periodically. <laughs> Quite right. I think I, the thing about art, though, and artists is uh, often that's, that's a very painful thing to be. It's a very extreme and demanding thing to be. And going back to your point about mediocrity, I wonder um, if it's too demanding to ask all of us to be artists, perhaps, or take those risks. But it'd be wonderful if some of us were mediocre artists. Yes. And that's fine. Yes. Yes. There's a wonderful chapter in Timothy's book about, uh, called The Community of Truth, where he speaks about um, allowing each other time to come to the truth, which means spending some time perhaps speaking what feels like isn't true. And uh, uh, I just, 
uh, say my, my uh, work, we, we're setting up an institute at Westminster Abbey, and flattery by, 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 uh, by, uh, <coughs> by mimicry. Um, and one of the questions that co that's coming up there um, amongst uh, parliamentarians in particular because of our location is this desperate hunger and need they have for time to get it wrong before they get it right, because every word that's spoken is in the glare of publicity. And it's such a tough thing to ask of our leaders that they should be right all the time, on message, instantly. How, actually, how can that possibly be possible? Truth takes time, as Timothy argues in his book, takes time to reach. Um, it's, a, it's a discipline, um, not just something that you have or you don't have. Actually, I want to ask you a question about truth. Mm. Sorry, this isn't here, but it's, <laughs> it's just you, you, you speak about um, there being an objective truth. Um, but it's... It, it, it's also the case, isn't it, that we all see differently because we all see uniquely from where we sit. Um, so in what way can we speak of an objective truth? I might stand up. I, I'm not, can you really hear from this? You really can, can you? Good. Uh, Aquinas said something really interesting. He said we can make true statements about God, such as that God is good and God is one, God is true, God is beautiful, but we cannot understand what we mean by them. Uh, and the, the meat, this is what he, his theory of analogy, um, uh, and I think it's very important that we both have the confidence that we, we don't have to be fussy, we can, we can make claims about God. But if they're true claims, uh, then they surpass our understanding because we cannot understand what it is for God to be God. I think part of the difficulty with um, the plodding literalism, which is so characteristic of much of modernity, is that we lose often our humility faced with the utter mystery of God. Uh, Aquinas said, we are joined to God in this world as to the unknown. Uh, and I think if you have that radical humility in the face of the mystery, you will stand by your little truth claims and love them. But they are only the ladder that you climb up towards the mystery which is beyond all words. And that's why, despite outbreaks of intolerance, in many ways, traditionally religious societies often embody an extraordinary mutual affection between people of different faiths. Uh, I was reading just recently that wonderful novel by Louis de Bernier called The Birds. And it's about Turkey before Ataturk before a secularized Turkey. And it's a novel about the extraordinarily beautiful relationship uh, between Jews, Muslims, and Christians. None of them doubted their faith. None of them did not have reverence for the faith of the other. And that implies that combination of confidence and humility, which is often lacking, I think, in modern religious belief which often tips over into arrogance. So there's a difference between a deep and observant faith and an, what, an arrogant one. What's the difference? I think... Uh, <coughs> sorry. Don't I'm die. I'm fading. Ten minutes. Uh, <laughs> Can you manage ten more minutes? I'll try. Or should we, should we let him go? <laughs> what are you going to give me if I hang on to the end? <laughs> Is that a whiskey bottle of champagne that you have <laughs> under the table? Anything, anything you want. Uh, confidence means that you believe within a tradition, uh, that you trust in what is received, that you trust in the venture to say more, that you trust you can try and say something, and that if it's wrong, somehow your beloved brothers and sisters will correct you. There's still a difference between that 
and the arrogance of those who got it all wrapped up uh, and are out to spot your errors um, and are looking out to ensnare you, which, as you remember, is one of the things that the devil does in the Old Testament. So is it like that at Blackfriars? I mean, the former. <laughs> Well, you're an ex-pupil of ours, Claire. <laughs> I just popped in from time to time and listened right. to Simon Tugwell. <laughs> you're all very welcome to enlist, you know. And very reasonable prices. I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful thing um, to see a, 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 a group of monks or, or, or nuns together supporting each other in this way in a community of love. But we're all also human as well, and we're also all capable of arrogance and conceit and fear, defensiveness. There was a wonderful moment in Of Gods and Men where Christoph, the youngest monk, is washing up with um, Luke, who is the eldest. And uh, anyway, they have a bit of a quarrel. And at one minute, you see Christoph turns and he basically says, oh, F off. And Luke just raises, ah, c'est la vie, c'est comme ça. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, I mean, I can spot uh, a pseudo monk in a nanosecond. And I thought, oh, this chap knows what religious life is like. Uh, I, I think that if you live together uh, closely, uh, then you cannot take yourself too seriously. Rather like in marriage, I imagine. Um, if you live that closely with a number of brothers, the moment you become pompous, they will tease you. I think, I think pomposity is incompatible with religious life. You might be able to get away with it, I think, as a diocesan clergyman or woman. You know? Uh, but with our brethren, they know what you look like when you get up and brush your teeth in the morning. And, uh, and they go into your room and see the tip. And, uh, and they've got memories that are very good. So I think that if you live together, uh, you, you can only do it because actually you, you, you laugh a lot. Uh, and when I was a master of the order and uh, a cardinal came to see me and he said to me, he was getting his red hat, you see, so I, I gave him a nice lunch at, at our HQ. And he said to me, now, Timothy, you know how lonely it is at the top. And I said, no, not with us. <laughs> you can't be one more than one of the brethren. It's impossible. If you became more than one of the brethren, you would be reminded of who you are very rapidly. Thanks be to God. Mm. Is it more important to be a monk than a priest? I I'm actually a friar. Oh, what's the difference? A Sorry. friar is a brother. I, I didn't actually want to be ordained. Uh, I, I can tell you, a, a little bit of me is highly suspicious of anything that smacks of clericalism, uh, clerical superiority. Uh, and I joined the order to be one of the brethren. Uh, and when it came up to ordination, uh, we are, most of the brethren are ordained, and I, I became very nervous. Uh, and uh, resisted. Uh, and I accepted ordination in the end because uh, I was one of the brethren, you know. Paradoxically, uh, as one of the brethren, I really saw that I should accept ordination. But for us, if you're ordained, you have to find a fraternal way of being a priest. You have to find a way of being a priest which has no, none of that awful tendency of clericalism, which you find in every single Christian denomination. Uh, I, I, I learned to accept and even to love my priesthood really in the confessional, hearing people's confessions, because people come to you in desperation and you realize that the, everything that they've done, if you haven't done it, you could have done. 
and that you're beside them. Uh, and, uh, and the immense honor and the privilege of being with people as they struggle uh, with terrible problems and even terrible failures. Um, and it seems to me that the only point of being a priest is that you have no superiority. Thank you. Got one more? Have you ever had a time in your life when you've thought there wasn't a point in being a Christian? If so, what happened? F funnily enough, I did. Um, it, it, and strangely enough, it was about just after I took solemn profession. You know, there I committed myself to the order. Uh, and suddenly, it all seemed boring. And other th things enticed my heart. You know, like sex and food and wanting to get married and have children. It, it wasn't a dark night of the soul. It wasn't as if I stopped believing in God. I didn't. But I wasn't very interested in God. I was much more interested in art and all sorts of things. Uh, and I, I had to hang on. Intellectually, I said to myself, well, if God exists and I've made this commitment, finally, I must rediscover the savor of it. But it took a few years. Uh, and paradoxically, and I'm not quite sure why, it happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, precisely where Jesus seemed to suffer from the absence of the Father. And it was in that place of desolation that I rediscovered a sort of sense of the savor of God's presence. And it wasn't, I think, that you suddenly said, oh, there's God behind that olive tree or something. <laughs> It was much more that you reconnect with a, a, a deeper part of yourself where God has always been. Because I think at the core of the deepest part of the human soul is God giving you existence. At the deepest part, you know that you're not an I, but that you are a we. St. Catherine of Siena says, enter into the cell of self-knowledge. First, I thought that sounded really Cartesian, you know, introspective. But what she meant was get to that deepest part of yourself where God's waiting for you. Well, Timothy, you've been absolutely stunning tonight considering you not been well and we have worked you incredibly hard and I feel that we you've given to us from the depths of your soul and certainly my soul is moved and I expect the souls of many of us in this under this great dome are, are, are equally moved thank you so much before we thank Timothy I just want to um, close the event by uh, asking you to come back in a fortnight to hear the great American theologian Brian McLaren talk about a new kind of Christianity. A film of this event will be up on our website shortly and previous ones in the series can be seen there now. Uh, the books are here on my right. Timothy, I think, can you bear to stay in? Oh, yes, everyone that's bought will make my bursa happy. <laughs> we'll be sitting there, so if you buy your book, and is this right, Elizabeth? And then you go over there to um, have it signed by Timothy. Um, and it leaves me now just to thank Timothy from the bottom of all our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Are you all right?